start a progression of moving through a series of instruments um, that usually are starting with a lower sound and gradually working my way up to higher sounds and that corresponds to the connection to chakras which are connected to different parts of the body and so I usually work through that progression but I'm in this place of intuitively paying attention uh, I might need to focus for a while on a certain area so I'll stay with that um, and just seeing what is required during the course of the half hour or the hour uh, usually I finish up with a drum heartbeat I sometimes find that I'm doing um, a little bit of a vocal chant. All of this is really being improvised in the moment, so whatever feels like it needs to happen is what I end up doing. Uh, usually it's very slow moving sorts of sounds. Sometimes um, it seems like there need to be some louder, stronger vibrations that I create, so again, it's whatever's needed in the moment. Um, at the end of the session, uh, similar to what would happen in a massage, I allow people a little bit of time just kind of come back and usually we sit down for a few minutes afterwards because sometimes I'll be getting some intuitive information uh, during the course of the process and I might share with them some things that I might have noticed as I was doing my work and you know, we finish up there.
And then, do you go by Dave or David? David. Okay. You live in Hampstead? Mm-hmm. And I guess just start off, like, broadly, just explain what's this concept of sound medicine and, and what do you do? Uh, interesting thing about sound is that it's physical as well as energetic, so you actually feel something in your body. <clears throat> so it's like you're getting a massage with sound is what's ha- part of what's happening. But there's also the energetic component that's very powerful. Um, and there's also the intention piece, which is where you're coming from when you're creating the sounds. So there are, some, there are a lot of people actually who use tuning forks to do the sort of thing that I'm doing, or they might use uh, Tibetan bowls, which you've probably seen in other areas. Um, and those can be powerful. I like being connected to what I'm doing and using breath as part of what I'm doing, so that's why the flutes have become really important to me in the work that I do. Um, There's a gentleman in California named Wayne Perry. He actually came out with a book last year called Sound Medicine, synchronistically enough. He uses voice and does a similar thing to what I do where he puts people on the table and uses the voice to create um, sounds that that can be felt in the body and, and that end up shifting energy for people who are on the table. He says the voice is really the ultimate instrument, and I understand that, um, but I would I would disagree slightly and say that intention is the ultimate instrument, and he does talk about intention. All sound healers talk about intention as the most important component. Um, but because I'm working with breath, and because I'm a musician, and I've been doing this for decades, uh, I bring to the practice you know, that, that experience, and so that makes a difference. Um, so I actually use flutes, and I use a drum uh, to create the physical vibration, but also, you know, to do some energy work with people. Okay. And why do people, um, when they come to see you, like, why are they usually coming to see you for? Is it to relax, or is it for actual you know, you know, issues? Yeah, we're, we're, if you've been, you know, paying attention to what's going on in the world, stress is becoming the key the key thing, um, and we we throw that word around, you know, very nonchalantly. But clinically, the concept of stress, kind of like clinically, the concept of depression, is a really it's it's a it's a huge factor. And I'm sure you know other people like Leon have talked about the same thing. So what happens when people come to me is I, they're looking for a way to reduce that stress that's having so many negative impacts on on their body and on how they feel and on their emotions, every aspect of their lives. And so sound is a a, a way to take care of that without them having to do anything. Uh, It has very immediate results um, without them having to get involved in the process at all. They just have to be there, uh, take a couple of breaths, and whether they believe in it or not, there are going to be some things that end up helping them to make a shift. So what happens during a typical session um, if someone's coming to see you private? Um, Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> it's just it's going to pick up the, um, the clicking. Um, if someone's coming to see you and you're meeting with them in a private session, it usually lasts half an hour or an hour. So? Yeah, they can choose to do a half hour okay. session or an hour session depending on how long they want to be there. Okay. Can you just walk through kind of what happens, sure. what goes on? Um, so I have a little bit of a discussion with the person just to see what they're there for, see if there are any specific issues that are happening. I had mentioned that sound is something that's felt physically, so if there are any physical things going on, I can even kind of focus on those areas when I'm doing what I'm doing. And how long have you been doing this? This particular thing, a year and a half, about. How did you learn about it? Or did you kind of develop it on your own? Um, it's kind of a combination of you know what I've learned from other sound healers and the focus that I've ended up taking. Uh, it was really about in the 80s that sound healing kind of came back into into the society a little bit more. It's, it's been around for centuries, uh, but there's you know, the Steve Halperns and the David Hikes and some other folks. Um, Don Campbell, who wrote uh, the Mozart Effect, which was a kind of bestseller. Uh, all those guys. It, very interesting because all those guys had their own individual kind of intuitive connection. Uh, Don Campbell talks about his, um, his experience where uh, he just found himself making sounds. He was an organist at a church. Found himself making sounds one night and, and doing it for hours. And that was how he kind of got introduced to this whole concept of sound healing. Uh, there are a number of people who seem to just kind of 
uh, be getting it intuitively and then finding a way to, to do the practice on their own. So everyone's doing maybe a little bit of a different thing. We were talking about this a little bit earlier, but are there parts of the country where it's maybe a little bit more known about? or? Yeah, as, as is kind of typical, I think, with some of these practices, the West Coast is a little bit ahead of us with some of these things. So there are some people on the West Coast that are actually doing using voice, um, you know, with uh, someone on a table similar to what I do. Their um, Tibetan bowls have been used in a variety of uh, circles for a while. Southwest is uh, using live music and yoga classes a lot more than we are yet, but you know, it's I think making its way over. Uh, I do certainly feel in Wilmington that there's a real resurgence of some of those practices happening. We're finding our way again. And are, do you have any clients that come to mind that you've worked with in the past year, year and a half, that they had a noticeable difference, or? Yeah, there, there have been. Uh, I've had a couple of returning clients, you know, who, who have, um, who have talked about how they feel after compared to before. Uh, I'm, what comes to mind, especially, is someone who um, uh, was getting some work done by Deborah uh, here at McKay's, getting some uh, craniosacral work, and. Um, I started off by doing a little bit of sound sound work uh, with this client, and then Deborah kind of snuck in and mm-hmm. started doing her thing, and I felt the need to continue for a little while. I was on my drum, playing my drum, and so I stayed a little bit longer than Deborah and I had planned, and afterwards, it was quite a few months afterwards, actually, when uh, she and I got to sit down, this young woman who was, who was getting the treatment, um, and she talked about um, not only the benefits that came to her physically and emotionally, but... Uh, how she she was really having some journeys that were happening at the time. She was kind of um, processing a lot of stuff um, while it was going on and talked about a lot of emotional shifts that ended up happening happening for her. Now, we talked a bit about the fact that I had stayed longer than I planned, and she said, yeah, it's interesting because I was envisioning this Native American who was kind of guiding me through some things at that time, and it felt good to have that drum happening while that while that was going on. So... Again, that intuitive uh, process is really an important part of what's what's being done there. And then, what's your background? I saw on the website, so you're classically trained, or I have what's ma- your music background? Master's degree in music education. Um, saxophone is my primary instrument, um, so I'm still using that in, in some other ways. Um, but I am using other instruments in this more kind of intuitive way. Um, I'm really a, a teacher. I kind of have both those hats. Uh, I'm doing some part-time teaching at Cape Fear Community College and some private lessons um, that I'm giving and just trying to find a way, as many of us are, to kind of balance what what I'm trying to do here um, this time around. Mm-hmm. Lessons on the saxophone? Mm-hmm. Or? Okay. And I actually have some Native American flute students. Mm-hmm. I've got a, a young man especially who's, who's doing some cool stuff. And uh, I bring my laptop, bring my MacBook, and we actually do some recording uh, of, his, of his improvisations and and some of the songs he's working on. So it's a nice balance of kind of uh, modern technology and, and the old stuff. Mm-hmm. Do you ever play like any um, sets or bands? Or I have done that a lot in, in a lot of different settings. I've played in a sax quartet that toured Korea. I've played in a, a jazz group on soprano sax um, I, way back when I was in a rock group. Um, but I seem to have, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out if I'm gonna, gonna get back into that or not. Um, Truthfully, as a, as a person concerned with my health, I, I don't really want to be playing in clubs in North Carolina because <laughs> I don't want to be taking in all that smoke. I did that when I was like 17 or 18, and I don't know if I'm ready to go back to that. So I'm still trying to find my way with that. So how long have you been playing since you were a teenager? Oh, I started when I was the age of 10, so that was 43 years ago, many decades. Ago. 53 now? Yes, now. Um, and was the sax your first instrument? You Started on clarinet. On clarinet. Yeah. Just had a. I was just talking to my mom about that a couple of days ago. Um, some some students really lock into a particular instrument, um, and as a teacher, I've always tried to go with that because I feel if they're really hearing a particular sound, they're going to practice more and they're going to get more out of it if they actually get to play that instrument. Uh, didn't seem to matter to me so much. I just knew I needed to make sound. Um, I've been telling this story for years. I should check with her to see if it's true, but my remembrance is that I used to throw these terrible temper tantrums, and then when I started playing the clarinet, I was fine. So I think I needed to actually make the sound. That was part of what I needed to do for me. Okay, and then the instruments that you brought today, can you just kind of 
go over what they're called and what they are? I'll put that over when you're playing them. Okay. I have just a few of some of the instruments that I use. The largest one is a shakuhachi, which is a bamboo flute from Japan. That's played in a different style compared to the other flutes. And I have a couple of what are called transverse flutes, which means you just hold them in the usual flute way. One of them is rosewood, and the other is made out of ceramic. And the material that the instruments are made out of really has an impact on the energy that they produce. So the wooden flute is going to have a little bit of a different feel to it. It's going to feel different for the person who's experiencing it compared to the ceramic flute. And because it's always such a showstopper, I brought my nose flute in case we wanted to have a visual of me actually sticking a flute into my nose. That I made myself out of a piece of cedar. And the reason there are nose flutes in all cultures is because there is a belief that the breath from the nose is more spiritual than the breath from the mouth. So you'll find nose flutes in a lot of different cultures. It doesn't make a lot of different notes. It's just about the purity of the sound. And a frame drum, which is made out of deer hide. It's a drum that I made myself. And the process of making an instrument is a powerful one. And I haven't taken it out of the case yet, but I have a Native American style flute that was made for me by a flute maker in the Southwest. And all of those have a different sound, but also a different energy and a little bit of a different flavor. Which one do you like playing the best? I knew you were going to ask me that. You can't pick your favorite? It depends on the day. It depends on the time. I do tend to go to the shakuhachi more because, for me, feeling it when I play it, after 20 minutes I end up in this little buzzy place. It's like a meditation that ends up happening, and that's really what it's made for. I don't know. Sometimes with instruments, playing it is really, you get a lot out of it. Maybe the person hearing it doesn't get quite as much out of it. The shakuhachi may be true that way. Maybe that I get a lot more out of it than the person hearing it. The ceramic flute is a very powerful energy, I think. I feel it, and I think it really kind of cuts right to the heart of things. People feel that one pretty strongly, too. Do you think, you're saying that a lot of this is with the intention? As far as the musician being comfortable with the music he's playing or with the instrument he's playing versus the patient's need?